Okay, we have plenty of time for uh, Q&A, so uh, the floor is open. Just raise your hand. I'd ask uh, people who ask questions, just identify who you are, where your organization, and try to keep the questions as, or statements as brief as possible. Thank you. Yes, here. Well, thank you very much for sharing your insight with us. I apologize for being a little late. Um, I'm a Chinese strategist. My name is Andrew Lo. Um, you talk about the um, leadership um, in innovation and technology, um, but a lot of the, the what's happening is volume. Yes. Uh, volume even in R and D funding. Yes. A uh, volume in um, um, filing of uh, patents because a lot of numbers. It doesn't mean that all these numbers will translate into leading uh, technologies. Yes. Um, and it seems that uh, the leadership is because, as you rightly said, is the scale of the market. So it, uh, uh, do you agree with the assessment that China's uh, technological ascendance is likely to be rather than invented by China, but rather than invented by, by China to own by China? Thank you. Perhaps. You know, the first part of your, your question I completely agree with, that it's a, it's a question of quantity rather than quality. And, and I think the, the motive there is that hopefully by mastering quantity, mastering the mass production techniques, spending more money, getting more citations, getting more patents, regardless of the quality of those patents and those, those papers that they publish or the citations, who's citing, who's, and then we know there's a lot of fraud and, and there's, a, there's a dark side to all of this. I think the, the ambition is to, to just go for quantity at this moment. And they haven't arrived at the leadership position. Even the globalization factor, this uh, idea of mergers and acquisition, it's just, a, it's just a, it's a vehicle for them to fast forward, to go more quickly to the frontier. And they haven't arrived at the frontier. And it's only when you are at the frontier that you can think of being truly innovative, creative, and being a global technological leader. And that is not the position where they're at now. I think they're still trying to reach the frontier level, reach the, the limits of the envelope. And, um, the second part of your question was, would it, would it be better to say that it's not, sorry, made, not, not, invented, not invented by China, owned but owned by China. China? I think that's a path that they seem to have accepted as, a, as an okay path. It's an acceptable path to be owned by China and thereby achieve global technological leadership. And once again, this is, you know, if, I think, if we think about it, I, the way I see it is it's, it's a shortcut way. Because these, these American or British or Japanese companies have been in this business for decades and decades. They've done it the hard way. They have, they have tinkered, they've experimented, they've failed in many of the projects. They've lost a lot of money. As we know, when I teach my students, what is innovation? And innovation is costly, it is, uh, it is uh, expensive, and the results are not guaranteed. And these companies, these American companies that they're now buying out, or Western companies that are buying out, went through that process themselves. What I feel that the Chinese way is, is a sort of a shortcut, backdoor way to, to reach the front of the race. So it is absolutely, I would agree with that assessment. It's not necessarily invented or created by China, but owned by China. Alicia. Uh, yeah, following up on that question, I think the economy strikes me as really strange somehow that, that uh, there is no mention of competition, in the, yeah. such as, you know, strong government will make it, or even, you know, uh, profiting from, from <coughs> Uh, monopoly, monopoly uh, yeah. uh, positions, as you just mentioned. I mean, how far can that go if there's no competition? Uh, and in the same line of thought, how far can, can it go to just buy? I mean, I'm not saying sure, they're only sure, buying, but, sure, 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 sure. but you know, the minute you buy something, innovation jumps out somewhere else, and you think you're buying the, you know, the best uh, on earth, and then it's already gone. So, I, I, it's a very simple question. Can you make it without real competition sure. in that huge domestic market where you know, things should happen, not elsewhere, just sure. buy it? Sure. So maybe I'll defer to Albert to ask a part of that question, but my answer would be that um, I think there are limits. There are absolutely limits to that. And I think you can only take it as far as the government is willing to protect that market. If the government is going to um, nurture local players in, 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 uh, in favor of international players who they're going to make it more difficult for them to enter the market to, to compete, and it's an uneven playing field, then fine. But these companies are now finding it increasingly difficult to go abroad 
And why is WeChat not used internationally, for example, to anywhere the same extent that is used locally? Right? So this is just one example, I think. So to answer your question, I think it can only go so far as the government is willing to take it to make this uneven playing field. And there will definitely become limits. And I think the largest companies are finding that they're facing limits when they go abroad, when they go to the Europe, to Japan, to the US, that they are not anywhere near as competitive if it's just based on the technology alone. Did you want to add anything on that? I'm certainly not going to let you off the hook, uh, <laughs> in the sense that I think if you look at the British or American experience, I think it rested on private enterprise and right. uh, competitive markets as kind of a driving competitive force. And I think economists <laughs> tend to go that way. And so I feel like some of the ways, you know, describing this idea of purchasing technology, I don't think that's enough to just say we buy a company that's at the frontier. I think you have to think, what happens then? Is there a complementarity between the capabilities of that company and the capabilities of the ch Chinese owners? Or the access that the Chinese firms have to other things, including the market? Or, or is there, uh, you could also envision that there's going to be an inability of the Chinese owners that are less experienced sure. Sure. than the firms are buying to really create an environment nurturing right. enough that those frontier firms can continue to produce and generate new invention. Then right. this could be a really bad model. I mean, which we're still probably sure. in the sure. early stages as well. But more broadly, I, let me, as the chair, just ask a, a, a general question. It all just seems too rosy. Sure. I know you're sure. trying to be provocative yeah. by right. saying people underestimate China, so I appreciate that perspective, which I probably agree with. But you must have reservations where this could all go wrong. I mean, there. I mean, government playing the lead role also has many downside sure. concerns. Yeah. And so what do you think are the things that would prevent, uh, what kinds of scenarios would prevent China from achieving uh, the flow decline? Yeah, well, some of them we've already touched on in these uh, two questions that were just raised. I think one of the, one of the key features is that um, this idea of picking winners, large state-owned enterprises that they nurture and then they grow and then they, make, they want to make them the biggest players. If they pick the wrong winners, those, they, if you have several of those wrong bets, maybe one they can cover, but if you have several large state owned enterprises who are unlikely to become truly innovative, that can fall flat on the face. And in response to the first question I said, in terms of academic research, there's a large body of, of, of literature that talks about the amount of fraud and, and um, the shortcuts that are taken to produce these research papers to improve the citations so they look good in terms of volume but the quality is absolutely um, missing. And if that force supersedes the genuine academic <coughs> research that they're trying to nurture, and that can be a, a, a big negative factor as well. Okay. Other questions? Yes, over here. Hi, Edith Terry with the USP MBA program. Uh, my question goes to the your argument about emerging markets firms and what they can do yes. in uh, collaborating with uh, China. Uh, I'm not aware of any examples of uh, uh, sort of uh, forward integration of uh, Asian firms or emerging markets firms into Chinese supply chains. It's usually sure. the, the other way around. The other way around. The lower yes. end supply chains moves to China, and uh, older technology is sort of shared with China. Right. No, I agree with you. I think this is a situation that I see as unfolding currently, and this is a potential way forward. If we, I mentioned the catching up hypothesis in that model, sort of Japan was a leader, the flying goose model. Japan was a lead, leader goose, and then you had these four Asian tiger or dragon economy sort of following. If we employ that model, then if China, so this is all coming to pass, it's unfolding as we speak. If China does become the regional leader in terms of science and technology, then we can possibly see other emerging markets like Indonesia, uh, like Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam, following in terms of that. But it's, I agree, it, they're, not, they're not any large, you know, headline illustrative examples as of yet. Um, so this was more my thoughts looking forward. And, and in, like I said in response to the first question, it's not as if China has made it. I'm not, you know, I'm not claiming that. I think there's a long way to go, but there are certain factors that e exist that are in place that point to um, China possibly making it, if it can overcome those negative sides, the, the, the headwinds, 
and the risks that it faces at the US event. I, I approach you, I also teach innovation and entrepreneurship at UST. Um, one of the areas that I find quite fascinating in terms of technology is actually medical technology. Yes. Because right now, particularly with all that genomic uh, and <clears throat> emphasis, there are a whole set of new tools, right? They're really, literally new technologies, not just building on the thinking of this relationship by technology. And one of the things that is actually problematic, uh, you know, in China, of course, is this whole question of medical ethics, you know, how much yes. can you actually test on human beings? But uh, without trying to deal with that particular question, what do you think about China's position in terms of these medical technologies? I don't, I must admit, I don't have a strong view on, on medical technologies per se, but I, you know, I, I actually would like to address the earlier part, which you said you didn't want to talk about. I think, so <laughs> that uh, China is giving a lot of leeway to their um, incumbent firms, to their chosen progeny, if you would like, to do what it takes to reach the frontier. And if that means treading on the fine line between what is ethical and what is not, you know, standards for uh, ethics differ country to country, period to period. What is unethical today was ethical 100 years ago and so forth. So I think that Ch China is, 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 through its strong government, is willing to test those boundaries and allow the freedom and the room for their companies to try and push as far as they can in order to attain this larger goal of, of technology. I'm sorry, I don't have, you know. But that's a very big challenge for Western countries like the US, where we like to think we have a much higher standard. Right, right. And we see this playing out in different arenas. Uh, me medical technology is one. Climate change is another classic example. China says, why do we have to adhere by the rules that you weren't yourselves adhering to 100 years ago and you're imposing on, upon us? So, uh, you know, these, these standards, so to speak, are malleable and, and fungible. And China, I think, thinks rightly or wrongly that they are within their rights to push them as, as, as much as they can in order for their companies to succeed. Silicon Valley for hardware design, Seattle for software, New York for publishing, Cleveland uh, for medical now, uh, Akron for rubber. Uh, so the idea is when you have, at, when you get to the leading edge, the benefic uh, benefits from clustering people with leading edge skills, ideas, feeding off each other, firms competing with each yeah. other. Yeah. Do you see any clusters in an identifiable area of production emerging in China that you could say, here in emerging form is going to be a cluster that could dominate in this particular technology. The only one I know is e-cigarettes. Right. <laughs> so not a particular technology, but an area of the Pearl River Delta region of southern China and Guangdong province, and especially Shenzhen, has become sort of a hub for prototyping, making designs, 3D printing is, is taken off there uh, very quickly. Uh, small uh, sets of um, items that you need to make, maybe 50, 100 to test how they work, how they don't work. So it's not so much a scientific research, but more the bringing to, quickly bringing to market small amounts of, of um, new products that you conceived of that you would like to test, maybe sell even. Um, that's happening in, in the Shenzhen area. Um, so, you know, a USD example, since we're from, many of us are from USD, is a drone manufacturer at DJI, who was a USD graduate, went to Shenzhen because he found that he was able to manufacture much more quickly with far less red tape than he was able to here, and much more cheaply too. And many manufacturers in the West are going now to Shenzhen because they find it uh, a, a center where in which they are able to bring to market their ideas, that the, the drawings, the, the, the crafts, the designs that they've conceived of intellectually to market, so, so as to test the product, whether it's, it can be made, how does it sell, how does it uh, perform different tests on it in terms of its functions and, and durability and so forth. A fellow Cornell alumni. 
Why are the best scientists in China still going to the United States? Why is China trying so hard to attract back talent that is in the West? Oh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, I think there, there remain considerable um, difficulties, infrastructural, structural, uh, governmental, political difficulties that, that um, individuals find it too onerous to negotiate and they prefer, therefore, to, to flee. And similarly, in terms of product design, uh, in terms of product quality, as well, I think there. That uh, so. Just going back to this earlier theme that I'm saying that I, I, there's no way in the world I think China's arrived at you know the global technological leader. It's still a long way to go, but there, there are signs there that are pointing in that direction. But at this uh, sort of intermediary stage, they they are they're far behind that frontier position. And sorry, your first question was. Uh, Do you think the firewall is? Yes. Oh, that's a that's a fantastic question, and I you know I would hap be happy to hear other people's thoughts. Uh, the, the immediately, my, my first reaction is to think of whether patents uh, promote innovation or hinder innovation. You know, some people argue that intellectual property pro uh, promotes innovation. Other uh, school of thought says that it actually hinders innovation because you're clamping down on, on creative thought you are able to build on. And similarly with a firewall, I think it can cut both ways. Uh, it can be um, uh, a promoter or a hindrance. I mean, first instance, it seems like no-brainer, hindrance. It, it, it can't help in any way, you know, closing out uh, information and so forth. But I've read stuff that claims in the same vein that intellectual property can also, uh, opening of intellectual property can promote innovation, that the firewall is in fact conducive to and beneficial to innovative activity in some way. So I, I, I have no strong position on that. And like I said, yes. It seems like a techno technological version of an infant industry type argument. Right. Gets or information. Right. Over here in the second row, this gentleman was in. Mark Davidson with the U.S. Council. Uh, given, there's been a lot of talk recently about China's economic growth slowing substantially. Yes. Uh, given the specific new place on uh, the domestic market as a driver of the technological growth, I wonder what uh, impact you think that a slowing, slowing economy can have. I, yeah, I think the potential impact is, is massive. If you look at the history, so much of this is historical research. If you look at the history of other countries, when, when economic growth um, declines, the first set of areas that, uh, in which funding is reduced is those measures and initiatives and activities related to science and technology. They're the easiest ones to cut. Um, so it depends whether the slowing growth and this, this slowdown in the economy overall will lead the Chinese government to redouble their efforts, push, pour in more money, pour in more resources to try and promote innovation, or will that be enough of a hindrance to say, no, look, we've already been spending way too much, there's, there's a lot of wastage, and that's another issue that I haven't talked about, that all these investments in innovation and technology have led to a lot of wastage, particularly for the state-owned enterprises. So it remains to be seen whether it'll, it'll be positive or negative, but the, the slowing uh, economy, since it's only been, you know, it's what, six, eight, 12 months max that it's been slowing for, remains to be seen whether that will lead to um, a, a reduction or a redoubling. And I think it can go both ways. Because when many of these initiatives that I talked about, particularly the 2006 to 2020 mid to long-term science and technology plan, were in a period where it was sort of the, the, the high period of China's economic growth. Um, but I would say that this, that the, based on what we've seen China do in the past, it seems like the leaders do have a certain amount of foresight and they do realize that low-cost manufacturing, labor-intensive production is not going to be the future. And they were as far back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, looking for other drivers for economic growth and therefore the push on innovation and technology. And I think that is, is what they deserve credit for, if nothing else. Because we see other countries in the world. China is not the only middle-income country in the world. There are many other large middle-income countries. And none of them have taken efforts in anywhere near to the same extent that China has. Uh, yes, I heard in China, it's the Hong Kong new stuff. 
I have two questions. One is on the macro level or on the government level. You have uh, mentioned about a positive indication of government resources into r and D. I I want a further understanding on uh, any relative comparison done between like China, USA, UK on the relative efficiency of government funding resources. The input and output comparison. Any, any, any difference? I think that could indicate whether the next step of the output from China would make yeah. an impact. Yeah. My next question is, in the past two to three years, I have quite in-depth uh, interface with Huawei, both in Samsung and Shanghai, in working with them, hiring of PhDs from Hong Kong, with in-depth visit to both sides sharing of their management process, particularly on two, two parts. One is how they manage the multiple research sites around the world, and how they manage the numerous research project progress in terms of resources efficiency. Number two is the people management system. I think Huawei is a typical example of China firms in making innovation and technology. Any, any study compare or done on this kind of level, on firm level, among China firms, leading firms, in their programs, which will someday lead to what your statement is true. So, uh, as regards to your first question, have there been any studies done on international comparisons with regards to the efficiency of inputs versus outputs? Yes, there have been some studies done by the OECD, and uh, China is actually very inefficient, very inefficient, there's a lot of wastage so all of these indicators in which they are leading or, or close to leadership patterns and, and scientific papers require an, uh, an extremely large amount of input in order to get that, uh, those, those levels of outputs. So they're very inefficient so far. However, the inefficiency has been reducing over time. So they're becoming a slightly more efficient over the passage, with the passage of time. Another thing that these studies showed, which uh, is not directly related to your question, is that many of these Chinese initiatives are based on technology. Acquiring technology, doing research, even the, at the firm level, buying technology, mergers and acquisition. But there's very little activity, or there's much less activity compared to, uh, so if you take R&D, research and development, research is the intellectual side, development is the making side, or science and technology, science is the intellectual, technology is the tangible product. There's a heavy emphasis on the technology or the development side and a much lower emphasis on the science or the research. So the basic science or the basic research is something that China is lagging way behind in terms of as compared to the US. So that might explain some of the inefficiencies as well because that, their, their model of inputs, outputs, and coming to the global frontier is one which is, like I said, a shortcut model. It's not based on blue sky thinking that you do some research today that maybe has no consequence for the next three decades. But after three decades, oh, you find that that research does in fact have some impact or, in, or uses. So that's another area in which China is lagging very far behind in terms of the basic blue sky research that has, may not have any potential usages at this moment. As far as this, your second part of your question, the studies comparing leading Chinese firms to leading um, um, US or Western counterparts, I only know of one that is only be started now, also Huawei, uh, led by a consortium of universities, Sun Yat-sen University and Zhejiang University. They are going to study Huawei and uh, the, the uh, counterparts in the US, but it, it just started six months ago, so hopefully we'll see some results there. My, my, my presumption, I assume, that we will find similar results as to, with regards to the overall picture, that they are less, they're less innovative, less efficient in terms of converting inputs into outputs. That's my guess. Because what we see at the national level is, is doubtless going to be mirrored at the firm level, at the individual level as well. Okay, I think we're, if there's one, is there a question back here? Last question and then we'll close. Hello, we from Swiss Re. Uh, it's interesting that you have Sinovel as an example of their uh, I think it's involved in a business espionage. Yes, yes, yes. So um, I'm sure there are probably more examples that also take on this. Yes, so no, though, though, I agree. Uh, it is, you're correct that it is involved in the business espionage scandal. And I think this, lead, this uh, points to the earlier question posed by the moderator, um, Professor Park, in terms of what are the headwinds, what are the challenges 
And I think one of the challenges is uh, this idea that in attempting to attain and arrive at the global technological leader, it's like trying to become rich quickly. How do I become rich? I can work really hard for 40 years or I can just go steal a bank. And now this is not stealing a bank. It's not stealing a bank. Let me make clear, it's not stealing a bank. But when you're trying to find shortcuts, you will invariably tread the line between what is ethical, non-ethical, legal, not legal, what is permissible and not, not, uh, not permissible. So I think that is just one example of this push to try and attain this leadership status, whereby that, that desire is pushing firms and the government to, to tread the fine line between what is allowed and what is not allowed. That's the way I see it. That's my interpretation of it. That when you're trying so hard to go so fast, in one direction, you're bound to find difficulties, especially at the margins. That's, that's my interpretation. Thank you. Uh, so on behalf of uh, ISQSD, Institute for Emerging Market Studies, ISQSD, Institute for Public Policy, and EY Hong Kong, I want to thank everybody for their attendance today. Please keep your eye open for advertisements for future events. And finally, I want to thank again our speaker, Namar Sharif, for a very stimulating. And thank you for the great questions as well.